Thank you for the beauty of this day. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all the way until this point in the day, O oh God. Father, we have seen danger, seen and unseen, O oh Lord. Father, we have gone through some trials and maybe tribulations even, O oh Lord. But Father, even in these moments, O oh God, we just say thank you, Father, for you have been a keeper. Father, you kept us throughout all that we, all that went around, all the issues that, that surrounded us, that, that went on around us, oh God. You just kept us, Father. We say thank you, oh Lord. We don't take it for granted, oh Lord, because you don't have to do it, but you do it because of the grace that abides within you, oh God. And Father, even as we pray, oh Lord, we pray that, continue to pray for our pastor and our first lady, oh Lord, pray for our first family. Continue to strengthen them, oh God, and have them to be um, continue to have them to grow, Father, even in grace, Father, even as they, even as Pastor Tatum continues to get well, oh God, we pray that you will bless him, Father, strengthen his his ankle, Father, strengthen his leg, oh Lord, continue to bless Sister Tatum, oh God. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty, we are in Acts chapter 2. I think we are still in Acts chapter 2. We almost done with Acts 2. Let's see what we got. We are almost the Acts 2 is a very long chapter. It's a very, very long chapter. Let's see. Jesus has God raised up before we are witnesses. The last thing we talked about was the connection to David, and he connected it to the yep. We are definitely in Acts chapter 2. They, are, they were pricked in their heart. Okay. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know sure that God has. To, okay. We stopped at verse 36. We stopped at verse 36. So we're going to be able to finish out this. We should be able to finish out this chapter today at least. So let's try. Ch uh, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made. That same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our, our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from the untowered generation. Un save, your save yourselves from this untowered generation. Mm -hmm. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Well, we're going to stop there and see if we make it past that. Let's see. All righty. So, uh, Peter continues, uh, is continuing his uh, diatribe, if you will. is definitely uh, uh, him talking to these people, these uh, Jews. He appeals to the Jews through not only their history. He appeals to the Jews through their, uh, through the law. He, appeal, he appeals to the Jews through the um, through um, the Talmud, the tradition, and the temple. So those are the three T's of, of Judaism, and he appeals to them in all three, right? So he talks, he uses Joel as an example. They, they would have understood the prophecy. They understood prophecy. Uh, he speaks about, he speaks to them through David. David, who is the um, one of the patriarchs of the faith, he speaks of he he uses, who utilizes that to connect Jesus to uh, Jesus uh, Jesus to David, and he talks he uses David as a parallel to Jesus. And after he finishes both of those, he shifts again, and that's where we are in verse thirty six. Um, therefore, let all the house of Israel know, when he talks about the house of Israel, that's how we know he's talking to the Jews. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, let them, so that they might know with confidence, assuredly, so that they might know uh, with, 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 a, with a, a set hope and a set expectation. 
Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus. And again, this is him ending the uh, the, the connection to David. So this is a this is an extension of the previous part of the uh, of the of the text where he connected Jesus to David. That's why he said, "Let them know with with confidence." that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Um, Jesus, the Son of God, uh, uh, it, Jesus is the Son of God, but Jesus is God, right? He's not just the Son of God, uh, he is God, right? Uh, when we see in, in Genesis 1, uh, let us create, um, when we see in, in, in John 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was uh, in the beginning with God, and by him were all things made, and not anything was made that was made. Right, so Jesus is not just the Son of God, Jesus is God, that is God in the triune sense. And Peter is uh, uh, extending it, making it clear to them that the one in which you crucified less than 50 left it less than 60 days ago uh he is the one in which david talked about he is the one in which uh uh joel spoke of uh he is the one whom we have been looking for he is the messiah he is god with us this is the same jesus that god has that you crucified the same jesus you crucified is the one whom God, um, um, whom ye have crucified, both, is both Lord and Christ, right? He is the Lord and Christ. Uh, so the words of Peter uh, become piercing to the hearts of those who hear him. He has the attention of, of, of the people, and his words become piercing to them in that they become convicted. And I want us to have this understanding about uh, the Word and the Holy Spirit. The Word and the Holy Spirit should be able to convict us, right? So the Holy Spirit is given as a comforter, but Jesus says that it will bring back to our minds those things in which he has taught us, right? The Holy Spirit is given uh, to, to remind us uh, of the ways in which we are supposed to live out our, our Christian uh, live out our relationship with God through man, right? So the Holy, the coming of the Holy Spirit should be convicting to us. And it is the, it is the Holy Spirit that is convicting to these people in this text at this time. So now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. You know, they, they had been convicted. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what men and brothers, what can we do? Right, right. Uh, a call, the, uh, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit in its earliest form in the manifestation of the life of a person. The earliest, the, the, the very first form, I would say, of the Holy Spirit um, and, the, and, and its manifestation in the life of a person should be. It, the manifestation uh, will be the conviction. Uh, the Holy Spirit will convict us, right? So we are only saved. We are only saved if we have been convicted by the Holy Spirit. We are only saved if we, one, are convicted by the Holy Spirit, and two, accept uh, the, the free gift of salvation. So, so the Holy Spirit has to convict us, and then the Holy Spirit has to, then we have to accept uh, that we have this need for a Savior. So the Holy Spirit can convict us, and we have this conviction in which these people have, and once we are convicted, our response to the conviction uh, is to what? Repentance. Our response to the conviction uh, uh, in order to uh, accept salvation should be our uh, admittance of our sins, A, our belief in Jesus Christ, B, and our confession of our sins, the ABC. That, that, that should be the response of 
the conviction. So you see in this text, these people are convicted. It says pricked in their heart. And they ask, what can we do? They have been convicted and they recognize that conviction should lead them to an action. And for us, the conviction is us accepting Jesus as the Christ to be our Lord and Savior. So their, their, their conviction is lead, leads them to an action. And they ask, what can we do? What can we do? And, the, and it should be the same thing with us. When we are convicted, we should be asking, what can we do? So when we are convicted, so let's say we are already in the, in the ark of saved. We are already of the way. We are already Christian. The Holy Spirit still convicts us. And in the convictions, we are still, our response is still to say, what can we do? Because the Holy Spirit is not convicting us uh, just for fun and games. The Holy Spirit is convicting us because maybe it, because we're supposed to do something. There's an action we should be doing. There's a, 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 a turning away, perhaps, that we need to be doing. Maybe there's an action for us to move into action to do something. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, our response should be to move into action, whatever the action is that the Spirit is telling us to do. These people were convicted, and their action that, that they were uh, looking towards was uh, they asked the disciples, what are we supposed to do after knowing these things and feeling this way? And listen to what Peter says. Again, Peter is not uh, uh, that well of a learned man. Peter was a fisherman. Um, Peter uh, was not the scholar in which Paul was, right? Peter was not a Pharisee. He was a fisherman. Uh, so, you know, while he might have understood fish, he did not necessarily understand, and he understood tradition. We know he understood tradition. We know he understood fish. But he was not uh, the one whom, whom people were looking to in regards to deciphering the law in a way uh, that would make people understand. It. He was a common man, and, and Jesus literally calls this common man. And in calling this common man, he calls him in close relationship with him, him, uh, him, James, and John caused them into close, deep relationship with him. Listen to what Peter says. Peter tells them after they have been convicted, he tells them that you are, to, you should repent. And that that word is often thrown around, tossed around. And the reality of repentance is we are to turn away. Repentance means to turn away. It means to turn our back against something uh, uh I, you feel this 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 deep sincere regret uh and, and these and, and these jews should have had some type of conviction right and, and, and having that type of conviction uh they they had just literally uh uh uh, uh bolstered jesus into being killed by the state because they did not like Person, it was it was it was all because of personality and how Jesus was doing things and how Jesus was saying things. And, and if you, I'll say this: if we are not being convicted uh, by the sins in which we uh, are engaged, if we are not feeling convicted um, in our inactions when God has told us to do something, if we're not feeling convictions. Um, that's a that's that's a that's a big spiritual problem. So so on, on social media we always see a red flag. That's a red. That's a spiritual red flag, because the Holy Spirit will convict, and the in in, in, in us being convicted, right? In us feeling that conviction, uh, just like Peter is going to tell them, it it should move us into action. He tells them to turn away. Repentance is rooted in um, this doctrine of uh, uh, we don't often talk about doctrine uh, and, and, and Acts and Romans and, and these New Testament um, books, these books in which Paul and but Luke wrote Acts. These, these New Testament books uh, help us sculpt doctrine around uh, 
what we believe God is telling us to do and how God is telling us to live as uh, believers in this world. Uh, repentance is directly connected to the doctrine of depravity. Depravity. Depravity is a is just is a big word that literally means that I recognize that I am unworthy. Uh, depravity is, is, is the Christian doctrine that, that I recognize my wickedness and my selfishness and my sinfulness. And I recognize all of those things in depravity because I have been convicted by the Holy Spirit, right? I recognize all of these things in, in which I, I do wrong. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7 when he gives his treaties on, on sin and, 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 and him knowing what sin was and how sin, uh, how, how sin had infiltrated the law and how it had been used, uh, how the law had been used to show him who he was. And I want us to know that the, the, the giving of the law uh, is to show us that we cannot do it alone. The giving of the law literally sets up the, the coming of Jesus. It, it says there is no way to be able to fulfill all of those laws in, the, in a way that will be uh, uh, pleasing unto God because, one, there are too many. Two, uh, in the world in which uh, they lived, we lived in the world in which we have been socialized, there's no way to be able to uh, uh, fulfill all of those laws. There's just no way. Now, um, uh, one could say they were set up for failure, but it was, the law is set up to prepare us for Jesus, to show us that there is a greater work and a greater, a greater way to interact with God through grace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, depravity uh, uh, literally is me recognizing because I have been convicted by the Holy Spirit that I am unworthy. And the truth of the matter is, uh, going back to Isaiah, Isaiah says we are filthy rags, right? Right. Our, our righteousness is as filthy rags, and, and we are unworthy. And, 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 and I want us to have this understanding of the Imago Dei in context of... Uh, in context of God creating us in his image, Imago Dei, made in the image of God. Because I remember being in divinity school and uh, 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 preachers in divinity school saying that um, they, they were good, right? Uh, and in the goodness in which they were created, um, they can't see how a loving God would condemn them to hell. And I want to push back against that in context of this text in which Peter tells them to repent and be baptized, I want to push back against that idea that we are good and a loving God would not send us to hell because the truth of the matter is in regards to the Imago Dei being made in the image of God, that's the Imago Dei, being made in the image of God in which we see in, in the creation narrative in, in Genesis 1 uh, and when he creates us in Genesis, I believe we're creating Genesis 2. Uh, what, we, what I want us to know is, is that in the purest form of, our, of us being created, in the purest form of us being created, it was not only good, but it was very good, right? It was not only good, but it was very good in the pureness of our creation. However, when, we, uh, when sin entered the world, while we are still good and we are made in the image of God, that image had been tainted because of the sinfulness in which we inherit from Adam. Some folks don't believe in original sin. I believe in original sin. That the, the, the sin of Adam, which now is marked upon us, which uh, I think is at, um, Romans 5, Romans 6 talks about the original sin. Uh, it, it, it's, it's marked upon us in which, in which we are unworthy and the only thing that makes us worthy is being in Christ. And I cannot get in Christ if, one, I cannot recognize that I have a problem. And my problem is that, that is why David said, going back to David, 
going back to that, when David says uh, in Psalms 51, I believe, he says, I was born into sin. And in my mother's womb was I shapen into iniquity. Because this flesh that I am in, and this flesh that you are in, the flesh that we are in, the same flesh in which these Jews are in, uh, it, 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 we are unworthy. And that is why, if, if unless the Holy Spirit convicts us to look at ourselves through a lens of depravity that says that I am unworthy and in need of a savior unless the Holy Spirit does that salvation cannot come to us so we have to uh, 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 in order to get to the point of salvation the spirit must first convict us and after the Spirit convicts us, that the same Spirit that convicts us should show us, I cannot do this on my own. A person will never, will never go seeking out a hospital until they accept that they're sick. I don't need a doctor. Nothing's wrong with me. Denial, I'm going to tell you, is not just a river in Egypt. You know, uh, unless you see a problem, when you look at 12-step programs, when we look at, 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 at addiction, uh, the first step, you have to admit you have a problem. And we as Christians, we as believers, we at, and, and even those who are, who might not be believers yet, um, if the Holy Spirit does not convict you and the Holy Spirit does not, does not prick your heart like the Holy Spirit pricked these people's heart in this text. And unless the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and you feel the, the, your heartstrings being pulled, you will not think that you're depressed and you will continue to go on in this world believing that you're okay. And we have a lot of walking dead people who think they are okay. Oh, I'm a good person. I'm going to make it into heaven simply because I do good things, simply because I, I follow after the golden rule. I do unto others as, uh, as, 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 as they would do unto me. But I want us to know our understanding of Christianity, our understanding of salvation, our understanding of uh, of what it means to be saved means that you have to, one, be convicted of the Holy Spirit. Two, you have to recognize your depravity and turn on, and, and three, and, and recognize that you accept the Savior to be the one who's going to forgive you. If it does not, if you are not, if you have not accepted Jesus the Christ as your Lord and Savior, upon your conviction of being of recognizing your depravity, I hate to be the one to tell you, I don't care how much money you give away, I don't care how many meals you serve, all those things are well and good, and it speaks about a great moral standard that you have. But unless you are in Christ, you will not die and go to heaven. It requires not just a conviction of the Holy Spirit. It requires you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And, to, and in accepting him as your Lord and Savior, and you confessing your sin, then you are saved, and the Holy Spirit will come and live in your heart. That is what is, that is what is required. That's what he says. Peter says, oh, repent. And again, repentance is connected to depravity. If we do not recognize that we have a problem, we will never, we will never accept that, and never accept that, and we will never see the need to repent. He tells them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and she, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everything I just said, that's what happened. That's exactly how he tells them to do He tells them to repent, recognize you're, you're, you're depraved, be baptized. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is the outward sign of inward grace. It is a symbol of our faith. It is not a means of our grace. Baptism is a symbol of our faith. It is not a means of, of grace. It's a symbol of our faith. He tells them to be baptized. 
in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Remission of sins, uh, when, you re re when you are redeemed, that means you are brought back. So the remission of sins being brought back, um, being saved, being delivered from that sin. Um, when he talks about sin here, he's not talking, he's talking about sin in regards to sin, not just as a verb, but sin as a noun for the remission of your sin, tra being transformed um, in Christ. Now, that does not mean you're not going to sin. We are going to sin daily. We are sinful creatures by nature. Uh, we are seeking to live above that by living out our, our call of God through in fellowship with one another, through stewardship unto God, and, and even in our worship unto God, but we still struggle. He tells them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Understand this, the Holy Spirit is, is, is given unto us when we have accepted Jesus the Christ, it is given unto us. Us, the feeling of the Holy Spirit is something that occurs over time and time and time again. It is not a one-time feeling and then you're done. No, having the Holy Spirit is like having a good water bottle. You need to continue to fill that water bottle up. Why? Because in filling it up, when you get in hot situations, what can you do? You can drink from that water bottle. And when the water bottle gets low, you fill that water bottle up. In order to fill up on the Holy Spirit, we have to pour some things into ourselves to get filled. So he tells them, be baptized and you can receive the Holy Spirit. For, for the promise is unto you and to your children. Understand Peter's perspective. Peter was given. Peter is going to be a, 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 a beacon of light unto the the, 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 the the Jews, right? He when he talks to them about for the promises unto you, Peter is going to be is going to work and and, and strive to bring Judaism into Christianity. Uh, Paul is going. Paul, who was who was who was the uh, the very smart one when Monday night Bible study we we're looking at Paul in the Church of Corinth. Paul is going to uh, go towards the Gentiles and in telling the Gentiles about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So when Peter when Peter says, "For the promise is unto you," be mindful, Jesus. You know, you know, P Paul is going to say this also around Acts chapter, uh, around Romans chapter 10, that the desire is for Israel to be saved. The desire is for them to come unto the, 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 the accepting knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord is saying. When he talks, when Peter talks about for the promise is unto you and to your children. He's talking about the promise of God with us. The promise of he is the Messiah. He is Emmanuel. The promise of he who we have been looking for. The promise of the one who comes from the shoot of Jesse. The one who's from the stump of Jesse. The promise is for you and your children. But you cannot ex receive him until you have accepted that you have done that which is wrong. He tells them the promise is for you. The promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God, again, 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 uh, unless we are, are called of God. Unless we, unless God uh, 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 convicts us, he tells them the promise is for the, the Jews, the promise is for you. G the Gentiles, the promise is for you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? The promise is for all who have been convicted by the Holy Spirit and will be willing to accept the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. The promise is for all of us. And it is not, and to all that are far off, all who have wandered away, all who are living in sin, in a state of sin. And understand, a state of sin does not mean that you're out here necessarily drinking and smoking and carrying a, a state of sin. Can also look like you having yourself together, you being an upright citizen in society. It can look like you you giving paying alms and giving much to the poor. Uh, as, uh, the state of sin is not a, a state of, of you uh, uh, living a wild, reckless life alone. It is a state of you being outside of the covenant of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is what that, that state of sin, right? So he says, 
is to all that are afar off, all who are living in the state of sin. And who? And he said, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, God must call us unto salvation. God must call us unto salvation. And that call comes through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And with many other words, this is verse 40. When I get to verse 40, yeah, I might get through this whole text. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untowered generation. He's, 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 he's extolling them, right? He's, he's trying to, to utilize these words to push them away from, from the sinfulness. They have already been convicted. We saw the conviction of them in verse number uh, 38, verse number 36. We see they've, they've been convicted. He's trying to push them. He's trying to, to extol them. He's trying to use exhortation to encourage them to turn away. He says, save yourselves from this untowered generation. When he says, saying, save yourself, we cannot save ourselves. Salvation is not in our hands. What he is saying when he says, save yourself, accept Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. Save yourself, and in saving yourself, what are you going to do? You're going to accept Christ and turn away from that self repent, which he has already said. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So this is a reminder that even when, when we preach, this is a reminder to me, even when we preach, and even when the Holy Spirit convicts humanity, even when you preach and even when the Holy Spirit convicts humanity, they, there will still be some who will not accept. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and whosoever shall come unto me, I, and, and, and will open up to me, rather, and I will come in and sup with he and he with me. Right, right. The, even though he knocks and even though he convicts and even though they feel conviction, listen, the gift is only a gift if you accept the gift. And this verse number four is a reminder to me, at, 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 at least, that, that even though he had preached this and even though many were convicted, not everyone was willing to accept it. And, and I, I learned this... Um, I guess life taught it to me. I, I, I preach, uh, and this is what Paul said in regards to uh, the Church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, I preach Apollo's word and God brings forth the increase, right? And the truth of the matter is, we preach, and the, unless the Holy Spirit convicts them, and even if they're convicted, unless the person be, is willing to accept that conviction, uh, I have done what the Lord has commanded, uh, for the uh, I believe it's in the book of, of Ezekiel. God tells Ezekiel, he says, preach to these people. He tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll, and the scroll tasted like her. He said, for if you preach, if you do not preach, and they go astray, he said, it will be unto you. He said, it will be on your head. And, and the re and reality of it, even for preachers now, even for my own, and my own self in the preach ministry, I am required to preach and preach the gospel again, simple, full, free. And in preaching, if they don't accept, then it's on their head. But if I, who has called to preach, refuse to preach, then it becomes something on my head. I have a requirement like Peter did here to preach the gospel, but also know that I, there's only so much that I can do as a member. If the Holy Spirit who is convicting them does not turn them from their sin, there's nothing that I can do to turn them from their sin. And that's the truth, at least to me and my understanding and the sermon of this. The, the, if the Holy Spirit is not convicting them, or the Holy Spirit convicted them and they're not turning away from me, a mere mortal. Me, my words will not be enough. But the words can, the Holy Spirit can utilize the words to turn them. But except they yield to that spirit. And in verse number four, it reminds me of that. 
do thy duty that is best, leave unto the Lord the rest. For he, for he preached this thing to them, and then they that gladly received, there were some who gladly received, and they were baptized. And the same day they were added unto about 3,000. He preached, he preached, and he preached this repentance, he, he preached this, the, the sermon of conviction, and, and, and some 3,000 souls were saved based upon their profession of faith. God added then. Not, not man. Understand that God will add to the church. And that goes all the way down here. All the way to verse 4. I'm going to get there. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So they, they, they're added to the church. They've been convicted. They are doing, uh, they, they, they've been called, they've been convicted, and now they have been commissioned. Now they're in the, in the work of the Lord. And, and it says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And the apostles' doctrine uh, aligns totally to that we serve Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was born, he died, uh, uh, he died, but he rose the third day. These are the apostles' doctrines that we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. Apostles' doctrine. We are called to serve one of the apostles doctrine they lived according to the apostles doctrine and fellowship fellowship literally koinonia literally meaning coming together and breaking up coming together and breaking up bread in prayer and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles the apostles could for these works and greater shall ye do is what Jesus tells them in the book of John and their fear came upon every soul, and signs and wonders were done by the apostles. They were done by the men who were in Christ, the men who had walked with Christ, the men who had seen miracles done, the men whom he said they would do that and greater. And all that believed were together and had all things common. They were on one accord. They were on one accord because they walked in harmony and in unity, and because they, they kept in their sight, they kept in their preview the Jesus the Christ, and, and, and this is what Paul tells the church of Philippi in, in chapter 4, actually when he talks about slip the sheet and, and, and you, you old is, I think that's who they are. He tells them if you can't get along, get along for Christ's sake. He, and, and having your mind focused on Jesus, you know, when your mind is focused on Jesus and you're really striving to live out that communion and that community with one another, they're not letting the pettiness at this point, later on, the pettiness is going to get in. But at this point, they're not letting the pettiness get in, for they want to be on one accord and have, this says, all things come. And what do they do? What do they do in, in, in living out this relationship? They sell their possessions. They sell their goods. So that everybody in the fellowship is able to be taken care of. We don't want one to go lacking. While one has, we don't want uh, uh, one who has more to, to, to think that they don't have a requirement to help somebody else. They have all things in common, and in having all things in common, they, they're looking at the whole picture of the fellowship. And the reality in our churches of 2022 is we need to look at the whole picture of our fellowship and how we are called to be not only in communion with one another, we're supposed to rejoice when one rejoices, we're supposed to weep when one weeps, and this is how they were able to have such a communion and a fellowship because they saw each other as themselves. After they got convicted and they moved into this community, they saw each other as themselves. When we see each other as our, as one another, when I see you not just as my brother, but I see you as myself, what I see is when, you're, when you have a need, that means I have a need too. And when we move towards that view and that understanding of Christianity as a communal religion, Christianity, just like Judaism, is a communal religion where we're called to rely upon each other and not think of it like this is me and mine and that is you and yours. No, this is a our thing. We have a collective suffering. We have a collective rejoicing. We have a collective uh, encouragement. We're in this thing together. It's like Fannie Lou Hamer. She talked about this in regards to talking about um, uh, um, being on one accord. She said, and she was talking in regards to black men, she said whether you went to Morehouse or No House, 
we in this bag together. She said, whether you have a PhD, a DD, or no D at all, we still in this bag together. She would say the collective suffering, the collective rejoicing, the collective encouragement of the black person in regards to America and regards to our enfranchisement rights is so important that we have to look at it from our, that we are in this together. Now, utilize that same mindset in regards to the body of Christ. We are in this together. And, and being in this together, we can have all things in common. We can, we can if one is, is lacking, we can make sure that they have. If one is, is rejoicing, we can rejoice with them. If, if one is suffering, we can suffer with them because we are in this together. We are not an island unto ourselves. We are not the Lone Ranger. We are in this communion and this community together. That's why they were willing to sell their things and, and make sure everyone had they had a communal understanding, and our communal understanding will keep us on one accord and will keep us in the fellowship in a way that will make us be able to, be, to sustain each other in this world. Verse 46, and they continue daily uh, with one accord, they in unity, in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, they eat their meat and gladness and sing singleness of heart, all of this it revolves around them being in unity. Praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were saved. They were added to the church. Not by man. They were added to the church. Not by all these other ways that we want to add to the church. They were added to the church by God. And we have to let God do God's atoning work. We have to let God do what God is going to do in regards to the, salva the salvation of humanity. We are God's hands and God's ears and God's hearts in this world. There's a requirement for us to do, but listen, unless God convicts and unless God moves, it matters not how well you preach, it, uh, Noah preached for a hundred twenty years, never even got a soul say. It matters not how many social programming, so social programs you have, unless God moves, uh, none of that is going to happen. So we have to understand that we have a responsibility to do the work, but the work is the, the church is only going to continue to grow if God moves and God can move through our work if God desires to do that. God can move through our social program if God desires to do that. He can do that and we pray that he will do that but understand this, it's not us that makes the people join the church. It is the moving of God. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is what it said and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be said. The Lord will add to the ministry at New Sardis. Not the preaching of Tatum or the preaching of this. He, will, he can use those as vehicles. He can use those as vehicles to convict the people, but our words are not enough. If our words were enough, if our words were enough, we wouldn't have a need for the Holy Spirit. Our words are not enough. It is the conviction of the Holy Spirit that the Lord will add to the church daily, such as should be said. All right, we got through the rest of this chapter. Praise be to God.